Well, let's get started. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you and we praise you. We worship and honor and adore you. We lift you up and glorify you and magnify you. And tonight we declare and decree that you are our God and beside you there is no other. It is in you that we live and that we move and have our being. Apart from you, we can do nothing. Outside of you, we are nothing. But with you, all things are possible. And in you, we are complete. We're ever thankful for your love, grace, and mercy. We're ever thankful for the gift of faith, the gift of favor, and the gift of the forgiveness of our sins. We confess our sins today, known and unknown, sins of our flesh, sins of our spirit, sins of omission, and sins of commission. For you said in your word, if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so today, God, we accept our, your forgiveness. We thank you for forgiving us. Thank you for making us clean. Thank you that the blood of Jesus now uh, puts us in right standing with you so that we have no fear of being rejected, turned away, uh, pushed out by you. But God, you have accepted us in the beloved. And today, God, we come with the full assurance that uh, we have access to your presence, access to your power, and access to your plans, even as you have spoken them and had them to be recorded in the word of God. Now we pray that you will let revelation knowledge flow, share your heart, reveal your mind. And anyway, Father, you bless us. We will be satisfied. It is in the name of Jesus we pray and we boldly declare that the devil is defeated. God, you are exalted. Jesus, you are Lord. And all who greet the prayer of the man of God, shout out hallelujah. Amen and thank you, Jesus. Well, right where you are, if you will give the Lord a hand clap of praise in anticipation for what the Lord is going to share with us tonight. I believe that God is going to speak to us and uh, cause our lives to shift into the better that he's purposed for us. Hey, Mama J Johnny Little, so good to see you. Well, grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. We honor and reverence the spirit of our Christ and we greet each and every one in the name that matters most. That's the matchless and majestic name of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. The Bible is right when it declares that there's no other name under heaven whereby men can be saved. And so we're thankful to be the recipients and beneficiaries of everything that comes in and with the name of Jesus. Uh, tonight, I want to jump right into uh, our subject matter because, again, I want us to have some time to be able to dialogue. I know you have some interesting questions, insights, uh, and perhaps even suggestions uh, as to uh, how we can further tackle and attack this issue, this, uh, this bugaboo uh, called unforgiveness, because it is the thing, the one thing that ties God's hands. God, God cannot operate uh, freely if we refuse to forgive. And we've talked a lot about that in Matthew chapter 6. Uh, Jesus says, if you don't forgive others, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you. So we know that unforgiveness ties God's hands. We know that unbelief or the lack of faith ties God's hands. And we're going to tie that in tonight. We're going to tie unforgiveness uh, into unbelief and unbelief into unforgiveness. Uh, and we know also that the blasphemy, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is a sin that is unpardonable. And by the time we finish tonight, uh, you're going to see how that factors into our teaching. So I'm not going to give you the regular spiel of uh, ways you can give. Uh, you will find it on the screen, and I want you to pay attention to that. Please, ma'am, please, sir. Most certainly, I will, at the end of our presentation, uh, I will uh, mention the ways to give. But I'm so excited about getting into God's Word now that uh, I want to make the most of our time. And so I want to thank those of you, the, the, 90, the 93 of you, who have joined us tonight. I appreciate you so much. Um, let, let, let me start where I left off last week because we talked about the fact that uh, it is important for us to forgive ourselves and uh, in order to forgive ourselves, we must see ourselves as God sees us. Um, we talked about the fact that it is necessary to forgive ourselves because it literally enables us to reclaim our power and resume our pursuit of purpose. That when we forgive ourselves, 
we reclaim our power and we resume our pursuit of purpose. Um, we use 1 Samuel chapter 30, the narrative of David and um, him uh, moving on his own impulse, uh, moving out of his own sense of rejection. He's moving out of anger. He's moving out of all of those things. And he does something that God does not uh, authenticate, that God does not in, uh, instruct him to do. And as if that were not bad enough, he has 400 men uh, who are attached to him, actually 600 men who are attached to him, uh, who follow him because he's the leader. And they follow him uh, on his ill-advised uh, campaign of war, and they get back to uh, the city of Ziglag, and the whole city is burned down, their children, their wives are gone, all of their possessions, their livestock, and, um, and they lost it all because they followed David. Um, there's a point in the text where uh, they take up stones to kill David once they realize the fact that the reason they lost what they lost was because they followed him the Bible says that David encouraged or he strengthened himself in the Lord. And it was at that point that uh, he was able to forgive himself. He forgave himself or, remember, forgiveness is a financial term. So he released himself from the responsibility to pay himself back for the evil that he had done, not just to him, but to those who were connected to him. Now, this is going to be key, and this is going to be challenging tonight because you have to learn to forgive yourself even if what you have done has injured others. Let me say it again. Um, and we'll talk about the heart that is necessary for that. You have to literally learn how to forgive yourself even if what you have done by way of offense has negatively impacted others. This is a revolutionary thought, especially within the context of, uh, of, of Christianity because there is an unspoken rule in many instances where if you mess somebody else's life up, you have to pay for it for the rest of your life. And I'm going to challenge you tonight scripturally to show you that that, in fact, is not the case. So much so that the men who followed David lost everything they had. But David, when he encouraged himself in the Lord, when he forgave himself, when he went to the stronghold to pray, to talk to God, to get direction from God, to ask God if he should pursue uh, the Amalekites, if he would overtake the Amalekites, two things happened. The first thing that happened is that God said to him, uh, yep, you should pursue them. You will overtake them. And then you've heard me teach this. God answered a question that he didn't ask. He said, and you shall recover all. David never asked God if he would recover everything that was lost. He just asked God, literally, could he go and could he get revenge on the Amalekites? And God said, David, because you have dared to forgive yourself, not only will I cause you uh, to avenge the loss, but I'm going to also cause you to recover everything you lost. That's a revolutionary thought. That if you can learn how to forgive yourself, you will reclaim your power, resume the pursuit of purpose, and everything that you've lost, and moreover, everything that God has for you, you will get it. You're going to get what you lost back. 
If it is in God's will for you to have it, you're going to get it back. And number two, you're going to get things that you never had. Last week in the text, we talked about the fact that when David came back, he restored everything that the men who were with him lost. But then secondly, he was able to return the things that the weak people, the people who were two weeks ago with him, the people who were too laden down with guilt and shame and regret and, remo and, and they were remorseful, but it kept them paralyzed. He was able to bring back to them what they lost, what they could not go and get themselves. And then the text lets us know that he also had some friends that he just felt like blessing. He gave them things that they had never had before. Somebody tonight is going to get free. You're going to get real free. You're going to get free because the enemy has held some stuff over your head for a long time. People have, have reminded you either verbally or by way of their actions and attitudes of your flaws, your faults, your fallings, your shortcomings, your sins, and perhaps even how those things have injured them. And tonight, we're going to address that. We're going to address the spirit of condemnation, the satanic attitude of, of condemning and damning the people of God to a life that is less than what God has purposed for them to have, for you to have, for us to have. And you're going to go to another level. You pick the right time to be on this call tonight. So, again, in order to forgive yourself, you must first see yourself as God sees you. How does God see you? We talked about this last week. God sees you through the lens of of compassion. He sees you through the lens of compassion. What is compassion? Compassion is its mercy or its kindness. Bible says in Lamentations uh, 2, 3 and verse 22 that uh, it's of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. His kindness. He's kind to us that even though we've done things to position ourselves to suffer and done things to position others connected to us to suffer, it is of his mercies that we're not consumed. His compassions, they fail not. God is ever, he is eternally compassionate. I don't have time to talk about or exhaust the whole concept of compassion, but, but, uh, consider the fact that compassion has a root word, passion, a prefix com, C-O-M. Passion is a deep or intense feeling. Come means with. So God feels with you what you feel. He feels your pain. He feels your heartache. He feels your regret. He feels uh, your shame. He feels it with you. Right? It's really interesting that in the day of Noah, the Bible said, the Bible said that it repented God that he made man. That God repented. It repented him. And the Bible says at, at one point, that he was getting ready, he was so mad at, at, at humans that he was getting ready to destroy them and he wasn't just getting ready to destroy them, it was going to be total de uh, devastation. And he had to repent the evil. He had to repent of the evil that he was going to do to man. So God knows how it feels. That is the, pur that is the purpose of the person of Jesus Christ. 
every every Sunday morning uh, at uh, at TCI um, at our altar prayer, we read Hebrews chapter four. There's a verse in there that says, "We have not a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but he was tempted in all points as we are yet without sin." He, even though he did not sin, he feels. He feels the weight of the penalty of sin. That's what Calvary is all about. The sins of the whole world was laid upon him. Not just sin as a principle, but literally sin as an operative presence. So he's dealing with the guilt and he's dealing with the shame and he's dealing with the regret and he's dealing with all that stuff just so he can identify with and associate with you. So that he's able to, as the writer of Hebrews said, secure or to aid you in every trial. Not just the trials that the devil, you know, uh, puts you through when he's trying to, trying to break you through attacking your, your finances and your health and all of that. But he secures you in the trial of self-condemnation. He knows what it's like. Did you know that Jesus knows what it's like to make a mistake? Not to sin, but to make a mistake. In TCI, you've heard me teach this. And the reason I'm going so far is I only got really one point to share with you tonight. Jesus knows what it's like to make a mistake. He knows what it's like. He chose his own betrayer. He chose Judas. Nobody in their right mind would ever choose somebody who would betray him. He chooses him. And he keeps him around for three and a half years. Think about that. Remember in John chapter 6, around verse number 67, 68, Jesus says, I chose you 12, and one of you is a devil. For he knew who it was that would betray him. And he knew that from the beginning. And you can get real deep and say it was a part of God's plan, but Jesus was 100% God, but he was also 100% human. And though he did not sin, theoretically, he made a bad decision by choosing his own betrayer and by keeping him around, knowing who he was, knowing how he was. And for three and a half years, he kept him. Somebody just got your deliverance right there. Because the reason you've been beating yourself up is because you tolerated something or somebody for so long that it has done great injury to you and great injury to those who are connected to you. But tonight, forgiveness has come to your house. To God be the glory. So we must see ourselves through the lens of compassion. We said that when we forgive ourselves, it's easier to make decisions that are rational and personally beneficial and corporately beneficial. See, when you get the weight of forgiveness uh, or when you get the weight of unforgiveness off of you, when you when you just release yourself from the obligation to pay a debt that, watch this, number one, Jesus has already paid for it. Like, he paid the debt on Calvary. But then number two, you've been paying for it over and over and over and over and over again. But when you receive the fact that you are forgive, you start making rational decisions, personal and corporate. Personal is you you make easy personal decisions and easy corporate decisions. We talk about the we talk about the uh, the prodigal son. He made some bad decisions. The Bible says that. Uh, 
There was a point that he was in that pig pen. And when he was in the pig pen, he came to himself. He said, I don't belong here. Now remember, he had hired himself out to a swine farm. He had, he had a contractual agreement with somebody that he was going to work for him. But when he realized who he was, when he realized whose he was, when he realized that he was in a place that was beneath him, when he came to himself, the Bible said he began to do, Mother Little, what the therapists tell you to do, self-talk. Started talking to himself. And made the rational decision to get up and get out of there. And number two, y'all remember, he didn't go back. He, he, didn't, he didn't go tell the man, listen, you know, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I appreciate you helping me through my bad season, through my rough time. He just got up and jetted. He didn't make no announcements. <laughs> Did, didn't give him any closure. None of that. Didn't give him an opportunity to explain. No two weeks notice. He got up with the clothes he had on his back and he jetted. And it was the decision that he made that got him in that mess. Some of y'all, the devil had y'all twisted up under the guise of closure. I'm speaking prophetically to somebody now. They're holding over your head. I didn't get closure. And the Lord told me to tell you, if it wasn't his will, the closure is you moving when he says move. That's the closure. They'll know that you got closure when you gone. They'll know that you got closure when you're no longer tolerating or entertaining whatever it is. Personal decision. Rational personal decision. The decision to protect your sanity. The, pro the, the decision to salvage what's left of your life. Hallelujah. Glory to the Lamb of God. You know we're not under no obligations to stay in anybody else's mess or a mess that you made. Let me get here. And get done. Not only must you see yourself through the eyes of compassion, but you must also see yourself through the eyes of justification. Somebody hashtag justification. Um, if you're going to forgive yourself, you must see yourself through the eyes of justification. Forgiveness is a legal term, but justification, I'm sorry, forgiveness is a financial term, but forgiveness or justification is a legal term. Let me say it again. Forgiveness is a financial term. Justification is a legal term. Another word for justification is acquit or to. You know, acquit is the action of, of declaring someone not guilty. Acquittal is is actually the not guilty verdict. And to be acquitted means to be found not guilty. Now, y'all gotta catch this. A not guilty verdict 
is not the same as an innocent verdict. Y'all heard me tell my story that, you know, when I was, uh, when I was uh, trying to decide what my career path would be, um, I, I wanted to be an attorney. You know, and even though in Elizabeth City they didn't have they didn't have a pre they didn't have a pre law major. Uh, when I finally decided, you know, what I wanted that I wanted to be an attorney, then I majored in political science, minored in uh, English and econ, that whole nine yards, because I wanted to be an attorney. And so, you know, I would, uh, I would, uh, during the, uh, the summer of my junior year, I would go to the courthouse and just sit, and I would hear cases, and I would hear people plead. They were either innocent, not guilty, or here was another one, they don't do it anymore. Guilty with an explanation. So they, I'm innocent. Innocent means I did not do it. Not guilty literally means that perhaps I did it, but I've either made restitution for it, or there is not adequate evidence to condemn me. And so when we talk about justification, we're talking about this whole principle of being not innocent, but of being found not guilty. So to be acquitted means to be free from a criminal charge by virtue of a not guilty verdict. So you could have done it, but your defense can be so airtight that even though you did it, Based upon the provisions of the law, you can be found not guilty. That's how all of these cops are getting off when they kill unarmed citizens. Because there is, there is a law that says that if these officers feel like they are threatened, they can use lethal force. Very objective. But that's how they're getting off. It's the law. All they have to do is say they felt threatened. And how are you going to tell somebody how they feel? So it's, it's, it's jacked up but that's the law. And so the law ain't broke. The system ain't broke. That's the way they set it up to work. Don't get me on that though. So now you have to see yourself through the eyes of justification. If you're going to forgive yourself, you have to see yourself through the eyes of justification. So I want to read to you in your hearing Romans chapter 5. Turn to Romans chapter 5. Give me about 10 minutes, and then I want to entertain some questions. I'm serious. I want y'all to write down some questions. I want us to have some, uh, some good, healthy dialogue tonight. I'm closing the lesson with this. I don't think I'm going to deal with my last point, uh, and maybe I will. Maybe I will. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. I want to deal with this. And then I'm going to give you the mindset or the attitude with which to approach the concept of justification. Romans chapter 5, verse number 1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, 
through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our suffering because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, character, hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has given it to us. Man, that's packed with a whole lot of stuff. So let's get into that. Romans chapter 5. Let me read it again in the message translation and then this plane is going to take off. Romans chapter 5, the message, beginning at verse 1, the Bible says, by entering through faith into what God has always wanted to do for us, to set us right with himself, make us fit for him, we have it all together with God because of our master Jesus. And that's not all. We throw open our doors to God and discover at the same moment that he has already thrown open his door to us. We find ourselves standing where we always hope we might stand, out in the wide open spaces of God's grace and glory, standing tall and shouting our praise. There's more to come. We continue to shout our praise even when we're hemmed in with troubles because we know how troubles can develop passionate patience in, in us and how that patience in turn forges the tempered steel of virtue, keeping us alert for whatever God will do next. Hallelujah. In alert expectancy such as this, we're never left feeling shortchanged. Quite the contrary. We can't round up enough containers to hold everything God generously pours into our lives through the Holy Spirit. Now, I need y'all to catch this. We read Romans chapter 5 in the NIV, verse 1, and it begins with the word therefore, which means that the argument of Romans 5 is based upon a preceding argument in Romans 4. What is the preceding argument in Romans 4? The preceding argument is the argument of justification by faith, and it uses the father of the faith or the father of the faithful, Abraham, watch this, as the object. So now Abraham's faith is the example of being justified or being acquitted or considered or found not guilty by God, the righteous judge. So let's look at Abraham's life for a minute. Because as great as Abraham's faith was, Abraham was a major mess up. He made some major mistakes. First mistake he made was, and it wasn't a mistake, because he did some thing, he did what I'm about to talk about intentionally. Like he intentionally did. The first one was he and Sarah were, were traveling through the land. This is in Romans, I mean, this is in Genesis chapter 13. You can go read it in your leisure time. And so there was a custom of that day that the kings of the region would just kill you and take your woman. And so Abram turned to Sarai and said to Sarai, Listen, I know how this goes. You so fine that when the king sees you, he gonna kill me so he can have you. So when he comes, don't tell him that you're my wife. Tell him that you're my sister. And she does what he says. And watch this. He doesn't kill Abraham. And TCI, you heard me teach this, but I just gotta bring it out again. He doesn't kill Abraham but he makes Sarai a part of his harem. Now, you know what a harem is. A harem is when one man has a bunch of wives. And so what Abram did was not only did he tell Sarai to lie, but he pimped his wife out 
so that he could save his life. Now, we know that God, you know, God protected her and God spoke to the king of the region. But still, Abram lied. Well, the first, that's the first thing he did wrong. Second thing he did wrong was God gives him this promise or makes a covenant with him in Genesis chapter 15 and says to him, I'm going to give you your own son. One of your servants will not be your heir. I know you're an old man, but at 90 years old, God said, I'm going to give you the fruit of your own womb or the fruit of your own loins. The text goes on to say, uh, I'm, in, I'm in Genesis 16 now. The text goes on to say that Sarai, you know, um, doesn't believe God. She doesn't believe God because she and Adam have, Adam, she and Abram have been doing what it takes to make a child and the child ain't shown up yet. So she comes up with this idea and she says, I'm going to give you Hagar, my maidservant, and, you know, I want my baby to have her features. <laughs> And so he gives Abram Hagar as his wife that they can sleep together and she can have children by Hagar. And Abram, watch this, he goes along with the plan. So what he does is he creates his son Ishmael, if you will, and Ishmael is not the son of promise. And Abram has disobeyed God willfully and blatantly. And yet the Bible calls him the father of the faith. Remember I told y'all sometimes your decisions just, just mess other people up. So when he sleeps with Hagar, she gets pregnant. Sarah gets an attitude with, Sarah gets an attitude with Hagar. Hagar gets an attitude with Sarah. Says... You know, I'm, I gave him something that you couldn't give him. I gave him a baby. And so now she goes from being a servant or a slave girl, you know, to flaunting the fact that she the side chick that can't give Abram what Sarah can. And the whole house is in disarray and the whole house is in confusion. And Sarah goes off on uh, on on uh, Hagar and Hagar's feeling gets hurt and Hagar goes out in the wilderness and God speaks to Hagar and says you got to go back and you got to serve her and she goes back parading her pregnancy around Sarah and Sarah is mad because every time she looks at Hagar she sees that she created an, a situation that has come back to bite her and that Hagar is giving Abram something that she can't give him and there's all kinds of tension in the house and Finally, finally, you know, Hagar is being mistreated by Sarai, and finally, Hagar, Sarai gets pregnant, and now uh, Ishmael, the older brother, uh, is picking on Isaac, the younger brother, and now Abram is forced by Sarai to put the older boy out, put the boy and his mama out, and now Abram has seemingly destroyed their lives because he has dis. He has disenfranchised, uh, he has excommunicated his son, and he sent his son out and his mother out, and they got to fend for themselves. And you want to talk about somebody's life and decisions messing up the lives of other people. Yet, Abram is the father of faith. Have to happen. Because Abram believed God or believed what God said about him, accepted what God said about him, despite all that he did. Let me say this again. <laughs> Abram Despite all that he did, he knew that he messed the lives of Hagar up. Hagar didn't ask for him. It wasn't like she was hitting on him. She was minding, she was minding business. She was obeying Sarah. Now, that life is messed up. 
And now a, a, a life comes into the world based upon Abram's decision and his interaction with Hagar. And now Ishmael's life is messed up. And Sarah's life is messed up. But the Bible tells us that Abram believed God Hallelujah. Look at Romans chapter 4, verse number 18. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed, and so he became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was good as dead since he was about 100 years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. Verse 23 says, the words it was credited to him were written, not for him alone, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness for us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. Now, y'all got to catch this. Abram believed what God said about him. And God said, because you would dare believe what I said about you, knowing everything that you've done. Know, watch this. I know that you know, but you know that I know. <laughs> and he said, Abram, because you believe me, because you believe what I said about you, I've acquitted you. I know what you know about you, but God says I've acquitted you. See, see, I know that you and they know your public See, but I also know that you know that you and I know your secret sin. That which the enemy is using to beat you up with. He said, but if you can believe what I've said about you, despite all that, you will experience the benefits of being acquitted. Glory to God. So look at how this works, y'all. If we're justified, now we have peace with God, which means God ain't upset with us, and we have peace with God because Jesus died on the cross. You know this. We have access, here it is, by faith into this grace. What is faith? The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. What he's saying is, He's saying now you got to have faith in what God has said about you even though you don't feel like it. Like, you don't wait to stop feeling guilt and then you forgive yourself. Guilt leaves after you forgive yourself. And it, it's a struggle. I'm telling you. It's not like you say, well, I, you know, I don't feel regret anymore. I don't feel the pain. I don't feel the consequences of my decision. And therefore, I believe that I've been acquitted. Nope. You accept it in faith. You accept it in faith. You accept the fact that God has, 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 has created you in his image and in his likeness, that, he, is, that he, has, he has formed you and that he has shaped you for purpose and destiny. You accept the fact that he has not changed his mind about you. It don't matter if, it ain't about how you feel. You accept it, and I promise you that the feeling will come later. Man, all this is so good. I, I can't really, I can't really unpack it. He said, we boast in the hope or the expectation of the glory of God. He said, we, <laughs> he said, once we understand that we've been justified, we start bragging about the fact. That God has better in store for us. 
Not arrogantly, but we start boasting. We start praising God. We start thanking God for the better and stop focusing on the worst. We start thanking God for the next chance and stop, for, uh, and stop focusing on uh, the last chance that we messed up. We stop. We glory in it. We glory in it. the word glory. Uh, the, the, the Greek word is doxa, from which we get our word uh, doxology. And it's everything that's majestic and everything that's splendorous and everything uh, that is uh, that is great and grand about God. We start we start accepting the possibilities of, of better that God has promised us, even though we are ha or have been at our worst. He said we glory in it. And he said, watch this. He said, not only this, but uh, our sufferings, we glory in our sufferings because we know suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, character, hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit <clears throat> who has been given to us. Now watch this. Remember we said there's no such thing because Jesus died on the cross. We said there's no such thing as a generational curse, but that there is a such thing as a generational challenge. In other words, like Jesus died on the cross, he shed his blood, he said it is finished. What is finished? What's finished is he has paid the price for the penalty of sin. So now when he died, John, John the Baptist said he's the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. He takes away sin's power to make us, to make us uh, uh, guilty and to make us shameful. Like he takes away his power. We just got to embrace it. So now he has come. He has finished his work. And now the curse is broken. But the challenge still shows up. And what Paul is saying, man, this is good revelation. God, I didn't plan to say this, but the Holy Ghost is telling me to tell you. When Paul starts talking about the fact that we glory in sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance and perseverance, character and character, shame, uh, hope and uh, hope does not allow us to be ashamed. You know what he's really he's talking about? He's talking about the fact that not only... The things that we go through in terms of what the enemy uh, does by way of attacking us, attacking our health, attacking our fight. Not only does that make us stronger, but as we are going through the process of correction and the process of discipline and the process of all of those things, character is being developed in us. Hallelujah. So when you so when you begin to deal with the consequences of, of a decision that you made in the past, let me tell you what it's doing. It's tell it, it's creating in you such character that you won't go down that road again. It, it, it's, it's creating in you the ability just to go through what you got to go through while God is teaching you your lesson. And remember this, God never, ever punishes you. Or he never ever disciplines you for what you have done. He disciplines you for where you are going. God have mercy. Let me say this again. God never disciplines you for what you have done. He disciplines you for where you are going. He disciplines you so that he can break the attitude that was in you that made you do whatever it was. He breaks that attitude because you can't take that attitude into the next season. So now we can say tribulation makes me patient. Patience gives me experience. I'm learning more about God. I'm learning more about me. I'm learning what my triggers are. I'm learning, I'm learning what my what my turn ons are. I'm learning what my turn offs are. I'm learning patience. I'm learning, I'm 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 learning discretion. I'm learning all of that so that watch this by the time I get in my next season, the last time that happened is the last time that it happened. Are you listening? Uh, tribulation produces patience. Patience produces hope, expectation. I'm getting off my notes, but y'all get it. Expectation literally means that God has promised me some stuff and because I have accepted that I've been justified. I am expecting what God has promised me to manifest in my life. Whoo, God. So even after Ishmael was conceived, you know what happened? Abram and Sarai kept doing what it took to make a baby. I know this is 
this is kind of this is challenging for some of us. But the last foothold that the devil has in your life is guilt, shame, and condemnation. Give me five minutes. Hallelujah. In five minutes, I'm done. So now I got to show you how to access justification. Here's how you access it. And this is going to give balance to you. Somebody hashtag balance. This is going to be balance. Go to Psalm 51. Psalm 51. Psalm 51. You know it. It's a psalm of David. He set this up. David is the king of Israel. And um, Israel goes out to battle one day. And David does not go out with his troops. He stays back at the palace. He goes up on the top of, of his roof. He looks over. Bathing on another rooftop. Is a woman by the name of Bathsheba. David sends for Bathsheba and says to Bathsheba, you know, sends a message and says, the king wants to see you. Bathsheba goes over, and David and Bathsheba have an affair. They're intimate together. They're intimate. She is pregnant. Bathsheba has a husband by the name of Uriah. Uriah is a soldier in the army. The Bible says that um, when David finds out that Bathsheba is pregnant, he sends for Uriah and wants Uriah to come home so that Uriah can sleep with Bathsheba so that when they go on Maripovich, based upon the fact that they slept together, he slept with his wife, then they could put the baby off on Uriah. Problem is, Uriah wouldn't go for it. Uriah never went in. He was so loyal to David and so loyal to the kingdom that he never went in the house. So David invited him to his house and David got him drunk because he feared a drunk man, especially a soldier who'd been out on the battlefield and has not um, been active, he'll go into his wife. He didn't do it. So then David writes to Joab, who is the captain of the guard, and he says, listen, um, I need you to send Joab to the front line. And David, being a warrior, he knows that the front line is the most dangerous place on the field of battle. And I even believe that he probably told Joab what situation to put him in. I can't prove that. But the text says Joab uh, sends Uriah out and Uriah gets killed. Uriah gets killed and God speaks to the prophet Nathan and says, Nathan, I need you to go tell David something. So he goes and tells David this parable. And the parable is, he said, King, I got a parable I need to share with you. He said, there was a man who had a whole lot of lamb and one who had only one lamb. And the one who had a whole lot of lamb, uh, he took the one that, from the one that had the one. And he said, like, what should be done to this cat? And David got mad. And David said he should be killed. And Nathan said, you are the man. Now David's conscience is pricked because it comes back to him what he did. 
I wish I had time to unpack that whole thing about David and Bathsheba because there's a whole lot of it. We'll talk about this later offline. But I got to get through with this. So when Nathan confronts him, David writes the 51st Psalm. And he writes verse 1, 50, Psalm 51, verse 1. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Verse 3. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. So number one, watch this. In order to walk in the reality of justification, you have to confess what you've done. Confess it. Don't conceal it. Confess it. God already knows it. God already knows it. Tell God what he already knows. And, and to really get free, get an accountability partner. Somebody that you're real tight with. Tell them, I blew it. But it got to be somebody that you're tight with and somebody you know. You can't tell everybody. I mean, even if, look, even if they ask you and they're not your accountability partner, you are under no obligation to tell them. I know that's messing with you. Listen, Jesus ran around talking about, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father except by me. He even makes a statement. He says, um, I am, the I am the Father, we are one. If you've seen me, then you've seen the Father. That means he's the Messiah or the King of the Jews. But when he stands before Pilate, Pilate asks him, are you the King of the Jews? You know what Jesus says? That's what you say. <laughs> he doesn't answer yes. Confess to God, Confess to your accountability partner. Even in a court of, listen, in a court of law, if a question is asked so that you don't incriminate yourself, especially if you get a, a good attorney, you'll plead the fifth. The Fifth Amendment gives you the right to be silent. Now I know that and this ain't even in my notes. But some of y'all make the mistake of telling messy folk your mess. Confess it. Number two, repent for it. What does David do? David says, listen, I confess that I did it. And he says, Lord, against you and you only have I sin and done this wrong in your sight. To repent means to go back to the top. It means, watch this, in your mind, you go back to the place that you were before the mess up. In your mind. That's just in your mind. Repent, pent, top, re again. Go back, go back. So now you gotta see, now you gotta see yourself as whole and well. Now you gotta see yourself as justified, right? Like as if you didn't do it. You gotta repent. So you gotta confess it. You gotta repent. Then you have to receive forgiveness. You see how you've heard me teach this? Your forgiveness is already established. I started teaching at 735 and it's 834, so give me another minute or so. You have to receive forgiveness. You have to, you have to receive the fact that your debt has been wiped away. And that's your greatest battle. Because you know, you, you, you know the messiness of your mess. 
but you got to receive it. You got to receive you got to receive forgiveness first from God. <laughs> then you got to there are people who want to forgive you. Like there, there are people there are people who forgive you. There is nothing worse than extending forgiveness to somebody. Look, look, I know what the deal is. I know what the deal is even if you didn't tell me. But because you did this against me, you did this against me, I'm releasing you of the responsibility to pay me back. There's nothing worse than a person who does not forgive or receive forgiveness. So you got to confess it. You got to repent for it. You got to receive forgiveness. That's what David does. This is what David says. He says in verse number seven, cleanse me with hyssop and I'll be clean. Wash me and I'll be white as snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquity. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Verse 11, don't cast me away from, don't cast me away from your presence. Y'all missed this. He was out of God's presence in the beginning. Now he's in God's presence. He said, I love it so much in your presence. Don't cast me out and don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. This is, <laughs> this is one of the only places in the Old Testament that somebody says they got the Holy Ghost. That's deep. It was a prophetic declaration that he has the Holy Ghost, the presence and the power of God living on the inside of him despite what he did. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I'm going to teach transgressors your way and sinners will be converted into you. I'm going to use this to help somebody else. You talk about receiving forgiveness. And he receives res re re restoration. That's number four. Receive restoration. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Restore it. Re to restore, 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 re again, store, uh, 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 supply. Resupply me with the joy that I had before this happened. To God be the glory. I'm done. I'll give you a few minutes to ask some questions. Forgive yourself and see yourself through the eyes of justification. You've been justified. You have, listen, Jesus. Through his death, justified you. But that's only half of it. Because remember what the word of God declares. The word of God declares that you are justified by faith. Miss this. You are justified by, by, by faith. Uh, uh, Karen, Renee, Kim, Jam, check this out. Here it is. Those are my cousins. They on the call. Okay. I'm going to prophesy it. All four of y'all better receive this. Um, I'm going to come into a lot of money one day. I really am. I'm going to come into a lot of money. I'm going to come into millions, billions. I'm just claiming. And I can say that I want Kim, Karen, Renee and Tammy, I want to give each one of them um, $9 million. I want to give all $9 million. And this is for them. It's theirs. But let's just say, well, I know that Karen and uh, Tammy and Renee are going to be there before the ink dry. But let's just say that Kim says, no, nah, you know what? I don't, I, I don't deserve it. I, you know, I, don't, I don't deserve it. Kevin got kids and his kids should take that money. See, it's hers, but if she never claims it by faith, she will never experience the benefits of what nine million dollars could do for her. Nine million more dollars. She's already rich as all get out. But nine million more dollars. 
that she could have to do more with. If she doesn't accept it in faith, in good faith, and saying, you know what? I, I don't, I don't, I don't see why he, why Kevin gave me this money, or she'll never have it. She's been justified, but she never had it. Someone wants me to expound on an accountability partner. So an accountability partner is, is someone, also Keanu Roberts writes some, so someone write down what Keanu Roberts wrote so I can also speak to that. So here's, here's what an accountability partner is. An accountability partner is someone that you have an agreement with and you say to them that I am accountable to you uh, and here's what the accountability looks like. I open my life up to you. I'm an open book. And everything about me, you have access to. And what I'm doing is because I trust you, I'm coming to you so that uh, we, we can talk about my, my faults, my flaws, my weaknesses, all of that, my struggles. That's what an accountability partner is. And let me say to you, never be accountable to somebody who's not accountable to you. Because the devil knows how to work and move and cause people that you take your dirt to, to take your dirt to somebody else. So always be accountable to somebody who's accountable to you. Even if it's a mentor, ne ne never, ever submit to a mentor who will not be real with you, who will not listen, who will tell you, I can tell you uh, not to do that because I did it. I hope I answered your question. What was, what was Kim's? Uh, Hi, Bishop. I wanted to ask if Moses made a mistake and didn't make it to the promised land due to his mistake, but Abraham was able to still be there be the father of nations in spite of his mistakes. Is it that an indication that we can mess up for good? No, that's not an indication. So, uh, great question, though, Kiana. So, so he, 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 God, God is what is known as omniscient, right? And omniscience is is he's all knowing, right? So he's omniscient, so he knows everything. But he's also sovereign, which means he runs everything, which means he's in control of everything. So I say this and people get upset. But it's the truth. Moses was not supposed to lead Israel into the promised land. The language would suggest it. But if God is omniscient, then he knows that Joshua will come along. And he has purposed that Joshua would be the one who led them. So notice what happens. The Bible says that, that Moses, because he struck the rock, God said, you'll see it, but you won't get there. Some theologians suggest that Moses did not necessarily die as a result of the sin, but he just slept or he, he laid down. Because it was not his job to lead Israel into Canaan. God chose Joshua to do that. That's why Joshua was training with Moses. He was Moses' understudy. And when Moses passed off the scene, now he's bumped up to the position of overseer. Whereas Abram was the only one who could have produced Isaac. Because Isaac ain't Isaac without Abraham and Sarah. And again, if you go back to omniscience and sovereignty and predestination and all that kind of stuff, Isaac was the chosen one. And he couldn't be Isaac unless he had Abraham and Sarah's DNA. I hope I've answered your question. 
Any other questions? It's 8.45. Any more questions? Are there any more questions, Mo? Looking now. Anybody else got any questions? 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, boom, fear, dry, zwei, eins. I just counted down in German. Showing off. Listen, before we close, um, there are ways to give, and I'm sure you've seen them. You're welcome, Kiana. There are ways to give. Uh, you can give online, tci-charlotte.com. You text to give by texting the word G-I-V-E to area code 336-891-4023. And you can cash app, dollar sign church favor, dollar sign church favor. Lastly, um, you can uh, pay by phone, 704-507-2397. We're getting ready to pray that we can close. Uh, Mo, take Elder Colbert and ask her the question, because I've got some more. The Lord just dropped something on me to share tomorrow night. If I'm free tomorrow night, we're going to come back on at 7.30. We'll pray. And by that time, by the time I finish praying, um, I'll know if I'm free tomorrow night. Because i got to drop one more thing on you. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for this time that we've had to share. We thank you for your word. For the interest of your word brings light, illumination. You highlight certain things at certain times and in certain seasons of our lives that we need to know. And right now, Father, it is the season, it is the time and the timing that those who have been weighed down with regret and guilt and shame, self-condemnation, be made free. There is a set time there is an appointed time of salvation. And I declare and decree right now in the name of Jesus that this is that set and appointed time. The gospel has been shared and you said in Isaiah 61 that the gospel proclaims recovery of sight to the blind, set at liberty those that are bruised, the release of those who are held captive. And I declare right now in Jesus' name that as the words are coming out of my mouth, release is taking place. Chains breaking, shackles falling, burdens being removed, yoke being restored. I thank you for a spirit of justification, a mindset of having been acquitted, a spirit of humility that will not allow us to be moved by arrogance or anger, but that will cause us to focus on the fact that we've been justified by the precious blood of your son, Jesus. Cause us to walk in humility in our freedom. Understanding of those who don't understand our newfound liberty and freedom. Help us to understand that some people won't, won't let it go. Some people won't get over it. Help us not to respond negatively. Not to fight fire with fire. But to walk in the assurance that we're yours and you're ours. Now, beloved, remember as you go along your way to render no one evil for evil, render everyone good for good, overcome evil with good. And render you all into the most high God. Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Sweet communion of his Holy Spirit. Rest with the Bible with you henceforth now forevermore. All who agree with the prayer of the man of God shout it hallelujah. Amen and thank you Jesus. Those of you who haven't given already. Thank you for those of you who have given. But those of you who haven't given already. Uh, I would that you would just consider giving a liberal gift. And this is really just to cause you to exercise faith. The people of God have been giving well. But I want you to get into the. Get into the habit 
of trusting God to do something supernatural with a natural seed. He wants to give you what you need to open your business. To be debt free. Hallelujah. So tomorrow night, 730, join me. I got one more thing. Just one more thing to drop on you. And what a wonderful thing it is. 